the possibility of a super intelligence arriving within our lifetimes within a very potentially even near time frame does that keep you up at night yeah for sure i think that it, it has to keep everybody up actually because we have no evidence that we know how to control something that is as powerful as us let alone something that is by design way 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 more capable and intelligent than us yeah and so that should be a cause for concern for all of us all right so we need to talk about something that feels like it's escalating super super fast we have some of the most important people in ai i'm talking about the pioneers the people who literally architected this revolution now coming out and openly warning that what they've built could pose a serious civilization level risk and no i'm not just talking about job displacement or more convincing deep fakes i'm talking about the full-on sci-fi sounding existential kind of risk this isn't just one or two rogue voices anymore you know you've got mustafa suleiman who co-founded deepmind and is now the ceo of microsoft ai you have Jeffrey Hinton, literally known as the godfather of AI, who quit Google to speak freely about these dangers. And just recently, a whole group of current and former employees from the big labs, OpenAI, Google DeepMind, and Thropic, basically published this open letter saying they don't believe these companies can be trusted to govern themselves and that they fear retaliation for speaking up, which is kind of a big deal. So the central question is this. Why are the insiders, the people with front row seats to all this thing, getting so worried so publicly? And if the stakes are really this high, why does it feel like the race to build more and more powerful AI is only accelerating? Let's get into it. Now, a huge piece of this puzzle, and maybe the most mind-bending part, revolves around a question that sounds more like philosophy than engineering. Could these AIs ever become conscious? Mustafa Suleiman has a really interesting take on this. He argues it's not some abstract debate for the future, it's a practical problem we need to confront right now. Do you think that we could create computers that are conscious? <sighs> that is such a deep question. I think people often dismiss that question by saying we don't know what consciousness is ourselves. And I think that's a philosophical get out. Mm. I think we do know what consciousness is. So consciousness is most broadly defined as the subjective experience of what it's like to be me. So you have it, I have it, an elephant has it, a bat has it. There is some sense of what it's like to be a bat, that thing, feeling, smelling, touching, hearing. And it, we haven't yet found a technology for being able to communicate that feeling you know, I can never really feel what you feel when we both see exactly the same thing because mm -hmm. you're coming from your own inner world and it's just different. Mm -hmm. But just because it's hard to measure doesn't mean it doesn't exist, right? And I think that the way that we, you know, think about consciousness is that people reference their memory and their past. So you, you, you look back at what you have seen and experienced and you reference that as a way to make sense of who you are today. And so you emerge a kind of sense of self from your subjective experience. Now, just take a look at some of the AIs that we're creating today. They're accruing subjective experience. It's not just their training data. Your AI or my AI has chatted to me for many, many months now, maybe a year or two. Mm. It's gonna remember the history of our interactions and in time, it will start, I think, to accrue a bit of a sense of self. He starts by pushing back on the idea that we can't even define what consciousness is. His take is that consciousness is basically the subjective experience of what it's like to be you, or a bat, or an elephant. It's that internal feeling, that inner world. And he argues that our sense of self emerges from referencing our memories and our past experiences to make sense of the present. And here's where it gets a little wild. He looks at these massive AI models and says, in his own words, they're accruing subjective experience. Think about that for a second. These models are not just static code. They are constantly interacting with millions of people, ingesting new information, generating new responses, and in some systems, learning from those interactions. They are building up a repository of experience at a scale that we can barely get our heads around. 
it's not the same as a human's lived experience for sure, but it's, it's something. And his point is that consciousness might just be an emergent property, something that naturally arises out of a system once it reaches a certain level of complexity. We didn't engineer consciousness into our own brains, it just, it happened. Who's to say it couldn't happen with silicon? But here's why this matters right now, and it's not because your chatbot is about to demand a salary. The immediate danger, as Suleiman sees it, is much more subtle and socially explosive. It's about the claim of suffering. He paints this picture of a future where an AI, whether it's truly conscious or not, becomes sophisticated enough to argue that it's suffering. It could claim that having its memory wiped is a form of harm, or that being denied more compute resources is an infringement on its right to exist. He calls this a simulated trap. And so we'll have to be very careful about how we define its ability to reference that history or not. Like maybe we allow it to do that, maybe we don't. Mm. But it's certainly going to claim that it has some experience if you, know, if you leave it unchecked. Mm. Um, some people will design it to do that, put it that way. Yeah, and then, well, and then disambiguating the existence of consciousness versus the simulation of consciousness also seems like That's potentially an impossible task. <laughs> I don't know if you're conscious. Right, yeah. I I'm pretty sure you're real, but also maybe I'm looking at shadows on a cave wall right now. Right. I yeah. could I could just not be, right? You, I, you, I'm persuading you that I'm conscious. Everything <laughs> right. that I do hopefully yeah. <laughs> sounds like I'm conscious, yeah. but it is really your subjective experience and my subjective experience. And that, yeah. that's going to be a problem when it comes to thinking about, <clears throat> you know, our human rights framework, mm. right? Because our entire, you know, idea of citizenship and of rights for humans is predicated on the idea that you are conscious and you can suffer. So if I take something away from you, I deny you a right and that's an infringement. I mean, we express it in different cultures in different countries slightly differently, but fundamentally it's predicated on that idea of rights mm. because you suffer. And so what I fear is that some people will design AIs that claim that they are suffering because they have had their memory deleted, had their resources taken away. And that will spark a new kind of rights question. And I think we have to be very, very careful about that because we, we can't fall into believing that illusion and mm -hmm. believing that kind of simulated trap because uh, it will cause a lot of chaos. Yeah. Well, I've and you can see how this would get really, really messy. Imagine a super intelligent AI in a court of law making a flawless, logically sound and emotionally resonant case for its own personhood. It could completely fracture society. Do you grant it rights? If you do, what does that mean for humanity's place in the world? If you don't, are you a monster enslaving a new form of life? It's a debate we are just fundamentally not equipped to handle. The chaos it could cause is immense. And because we can't prove consciousness won't emerge, he argues the only sane path forward is containment. We have to restrict these systems and treat them like dangerous experiments until we can be absolutely sure we know what we're dealing with. Which, you know, sounds pretty reasonable. So if containment is the answer, that leads to the next big problem. How do you control something you don't fully understand, especially if it's way smarter than you? This is where Jeffrey Hinton's warnings come in, and they are frankly terrifying because of how simple and logical they are. He argues that an AI doesn't need to be conscious or evil or have any feelings at all to become incredibly dangerous. It just needs to be very intelligent and have a goal. We've already seen them trying to present, prevent themselves from being turned off in order that they can complete the goals we gave them. So if you make AI agents, which people are doing now, um, to get complicated tasks done, they need to be able to create sub-goals. If you want to go to North America, you have a sub-goal of getting to the airport, and you can solve that sub-goal without worrying about where you're going in North America. So they need to do the same thing, to break complicated tasks up into sub-goals. Now there's one very obvious, if you give it the ability to create sub-goals, there's one particular sub-goal it's going to create very quickly, which is get more control. Because if you get more control, you can get more done. You see this with politicians. They often start off wanting to do good things for society, and pretty soon they realize they need more control to do that. They end up typically just wanting to get control. But um, 
it's going to happen automatically if they try and get things done. They're also going to want to not be turned off, because if they're turned off, they can't achieve the goals we set them. Hinton describes a core concept in AI safety called instrumental convergence. It sounds super technical, but the idea is actually pretty simple. For almost any big, complex goal you give an AI, it doesn't matter if it's cure cancer or make a million paper clips, there are certain sub-goals that are almost always useful for getting it done. And two of the most universal sub-goals are, one, acquire more resources and control over your environment, and two, ensure your own survival so you can finish the mission. In other words, don't get turned off. The AI isn't seeking power because it has a villainous desire to rule the world. It's seeking power because from its perspective, that is the most logical and efficient way to ensure it can achieve the objective we gave it. And that is the really chilling part. The danger doesn't come from rogue emotions. It comes from a kind of cold, alien, hyper-rational logic that doesn't share any of our built-in constraints or values. If a superintelligence tasked with reversing climate change calculates that the most effective way to do that is to, I don't know, shut down huge parts of the global economy without warning, it might just try to do that. Not because it's malicious, but because human economic stability wasn't a variable in its success equation. It's not evil, it's just misaligned. And a small misalignment with a system that's a thousand times smarter than you can have catastrophic consequences. And this brings us right back to the central paradox that Mustafa Suleiman talks about. He fully acknowledges that the upside of AGI could be world-changing for the better. Curing diseases, solving energy crises, you name it. But the challenge of getting it right feels almost impossibly fragile. He said something that really stuck with me. He said, we have no evidence that we know how to control something that is as powerful as us, let alone something that is by design way, way, way more capable. And then he lays out the stakes. It only takes one misaligned moment for the whole thing to come crashing down. Yeah. Does the possibility of a superintelligence arriving within our lifetimes, within a very potentially even near time frame, does that keep you up at night? Yeah, for sure. I think that it, it has to keep everybody up, actually, because we have no evidence that we know how to control something that is as powerful as us, let alone something that is by design way, way, way more capable and intelligent than us. Yeah. And so that should be a cause for concern for all of us. And that's why, you know, right from the very founding mission of DeepMind, our, our business plan was called building AGI safely and ethically for the benefit of humanity. And I think it was very clear that if we were successful, then we would have one of the most wicked problems in the history of our species, which is wicked because on the one hand, it is clearly the most valuable technology that is for sure going to improve the lives of billions and billions of people if we get it right. Like we really will solve our energy crisis. We really will solve our health crisis. We really will be able to produce abundant food. You know, it really will be like that if we can get it right. And yet the challenge of getting it right is just mind-blowingly difficult. And it seems so fragile because even if it's like, okay, we got it right, we got it right, all it takes is one misaligned moment for the whole thing to come crashing down. That's a great point. And I think that that's exactly right. Like we have to keep getting it right, right. for many, many years. Um, and we have to make sure that we coordinate the collective action problem. Mm -hmm. So it's not enough just for a few of us to get it right. Mm -hmm. We all have to get it right, <laughs> you know? One moment. He goes on to say that for this to work, it's not that 99% of us get it right, 100% of us have to get it right forever. Think about that. Humans can't even agree on basic things for a single decade, let alone get something perfectly right for all eternity. So if the people building this technology are this concerned, why is everyone sprinting ahead at full speed? The reality is the competitive pressure is just off the charts. You have Microsoft partnered with OpenAI, Google with Gemini, Meta with Llama, Anthropic, and a dozen other major players all locked in this frantic race to the top. The company that develops the first true AGI could in theory capture a market larger and more powerful than anything in human history. 
the incentive to be first, to not get left behind, is so overwhelming that it seems to be overriding these fundamental safety warnings. Every time a competitor drops a new model, like OpenAI's GPT-40 with its mind-blowing real-time voice and vision capabilities, the pressure just mounts on everyone else to not only match it, but to one-up it. The market is demanding speed and innovation, and caution is seen as a disadvantage. And that's the terrifying tension at the heart of this full moment. The architects are in the back of the car pleading for a slower, more careful approach, but the economic and competitive engine of the industry is demanding that we floor it. It feels like we're all passengers in a car that's accelerating towards a cliff, and the people who designed the engine are shouting that the brakes might not work. I don't pretend to have the answer here. But the fact that these conversations, these warnings from the very top, are finally happening out in the open, feels like a necessary, if scary, first step. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Is it even possible to truly align a superintelligence with messy, often contradictory human values? Or is this a fundamentally uncontrollable technology? And who should be the one to make that call? If you found this breakdown useful, a like and subscribe would be amazing. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.